My name is Laura Zeisler. I'm an assistant professor at Cedar Crest College. I'm a, the director of the undergraduate program and I also teach in the graduate art therapy program. And what my goal is um, through the talk I'm gonna do today, this afternoon for both of the sessions is to really kind of add on to what was offered this morning. And what I'm gonna try to offer is a lot of information because what I've been found over the 25 years I've been an art therapist and working with artists and being an artist and working with different populations is I heard a lot about where's the research and this is so great, and isn't this wonderful, and we see that all this happens, and we see all this great work, but I don't see the research. And unless I have the empirical-based evidence, I'm not gonna fund this program. So what my goal is, is to try to give you some information that will hopefully add to what you've already learned this morning. So the idea is, that arts and healthcare can come in five different categories, and I'm gonna talk briefly about what they are. So the first one is just having arts go into hospitals. That's when they hire different artists who come in and maybe teach watercolor at an oncology unit. So there's just um, bringing in professional artists to teach art on healthcare environments. The other one is art therapy. And what makes art therapy a little different, and I appreciate that the folks this morning, both Mo and David both spoke to, is the difference between a professional artist and a movement therapist, or an art therapist, or music therapist. And the difference is, is the training. Um, if you choose to become a therapist, it's like any other therapist, a social worker, any kind of therapist, you need to have your um, master's degree, that's a minimum base education. And I just think it's important to differentiate, and I personally think it's also important to realize they're both relevant. One is not better than the other. They're both relevant, and they both contribute in different ways. Arts and health, to promotion, pr arts and health promotion and education, community-engaged arts, and then this is the last one that I think is really important. It's the arts and education of health professionals. So at Cedar Crest, we require all the students to take art classes. And the nursing students are always like, no offense, Laura, but I really don't see why I have to be in an art class if I want to be a nurse. And how I try to explain it to them is your observation skills are a learned skill. And one of the best ways to learn observation skills is by doing art learning how to see, and this is actually a proven fact. So this is just some context in which we do the art. So what we find, and this is the research that's showing that what happens is when people are doing arts in um, healthcare facilities, in nursing homes, in assisted living facilities, we're finding these are the issues and the dynamics and the impacts that they're having. So we're finding that what happens is people are having a balance of their emotions and it's reducing stress. And that's a really, really important thing. I think we're now starting to realize there is no mind-body split that how we feel physically is also how we feel emotionally, and how we feel emotionally affects our physical well-being. So this is something that's kind of coming out. We found that when folks were engaged in art activities, it gave them a voice. And when people feel like they're being heard, particularly when they're dealing with their health issues, there's a direct connection to them being motivated to do something about it. Because if they don't feel heard, they don't feel like they can connect to their own health care, they're not very motivated to do anything about the interventions and the lifestyle changes that oftentimes need to happen in order to be able to make the changes. We find when arts are involved, there's a reduction in hospital stays. This was already mentioned this morning, so I'll just mention it briefly, as well as less medication. This means it saves hospitals and residential senior living facilities money if they have the arts. It costs less to buy paint than it does to buy Pfizer medication. That's just a fact. And not that I'm opposed to Pfizer medication, but it's just looking at the cost, because that's gonna come up a lot. What's the cost gonna be? I think the other thing that's really helpful and really powerful, which doesn't come up as much, which I'm excited to see it's starting to come up, is looking at multicultural issues. 
and really being able to address people from a multicultural perspective. And one of the things that we know is that the arts go across all cultures. You can go to any museum in the world and be able to not speak the language, not know much about the culture, and be able to appreciate and experience the art. So I think it's an important component that it allows that to happen. The other thing that we're noticing is that it's reducing medical staff turnover. And that is really a huge cost saver. And what's happening is when you're reducing the staff turnover, you're creating an environment that makes it easier for the staff to do this work. Because let's be honest, this is hard work. It is hard work. There's a lot of components to it. It's physically tiring. It's emotionally tiring. There's a lot of moving pieces. You heard already we started this morning with all the budget cuts. So there's constantly something coming at you in this field. And I think what's really important that I really like to talk about is when the arts are involved in an agency, it helps the staff engage as well. It helps them start to see the patients and the residents in a way that they can't otherwise connect. And I like to think of it in the expression that it kind of fills the well, kind of refills that place. <clears throat> and we've already spoke about this as it increases, if you teach it to doctors and nurses, it, teaches their, it increases their observational skills. Okay. So there was a lot of talk for a long time that there really wasn't a lot of studies that there wasn't a lot of information to show. And, and the studies were very much, there was a lot of you know, qualitative and great anecdotes and really beautiful stories, but there wasn't a lot of quantitative empirical evidence. And so there was this study that was put together through the National Endowments of the Arts and George Washington University, and this was Gene Cohn's um, study. And what they were looking for was to do a cross-country, they went to all across the country, and they did a longitudinal study looking at what are the effects of the arts. And really to be able to prove through empirical data that this is working. And this is the key. The people who were conducting it were professional, either artists or art therapists. And that's really the important piece, is I really think it's important to realize, while I think volunteers play an incredible role um, in the work that we do in the agencies and settings that we're in, this was done by professional level individuals, professionally trained individuals. And it was in 2006, so if you think about that, I know the arts have been in the healthcare settings you know, my entire career. I've been in the field for 25 years, and it wasn't brand new when I was there. 2006 is not that old. So we are just getting the research, and this is the research that was kind of cutting edge and really opened up the door to so many facilities to be able to say, here's the empirical evidence, this is how come we know it works, and based on that study, a lot of programs were able to be um, created. And I think what I talked about was just that it was one of the first ones to do of its kind. And it really didn't just do it regionally, it really did it across the country. And by doing it across the country, it was really trying to get a full scope of folks who are going through um, gerontology issues and how the arts are effective. Okay. The other thing that was different about this study that was really important is that he included, um, something that wasn't shown before, and that was a control group. So really, when you're doing an empirical-based study, you need a con control group, and that's what he created. So he recruited um, 100 people, and, which is pretty impressive if you think it's a three-year study, and we're dealing with a certain age group who has a lot of dynamics that can get them to pull out of a study. So he has this study. The average age was 80 years old. So that was the average age of the folks that he was working with. 30% were from um, racial and ethnic minorities. And they got divided up into the intervention group and the control group. And the groups were really well matched. So that was really important to him, was to have it so that 
Um, the cognitive capacities were kind of well matched within the groups, and that felt really important to him, as well as the physical. They were interviewed three times a year by research assistants so that they had a baseline um, a year later and then finally two years later. So they were really able to see this isn't just a one-hit wonder, like you go, it was so fun, it felt good, but really see what are the long-term effects and how does this actually um, affect people in the long term. And what they found was the folks who were in the control group, they just went about their life as normal. There was no extra activities given. It was just whatever their center offered stayed the same. And then the folks who were in the intervention group got a weekly art therapy or art group um, conducted by a professional artist or a professional art therapist. And this is what he found. It improved overall health and physical health. So people who engaged in one hour a week of an art program physically were healthier. They felt better. And what we know is that when people feel better physically, it's also, again, going to reduce the amount of um, need for medical intervention. And also when people feel better, they're also easier to be around. And if you think about it as far as our need to take care of people, I know what I didn't feel good over the weekend, and I'm sure my family was like, okay, Laura, you just go to your room, and when you feel better and are willing to participate, come back out. And I think that's how most of us are. You know, when we don't feel good physically, we get kind of crabby. And if I'm kind of crabby, my family could kind of isolate me and just be like, when you feel better, come back out. We'll be happy to have you back. But if I need someone to take care of me, I can't do things that I need to do on a daily basis for you know, just basic needs, then it just becomes part of a whole bigger cycle, that when folks feel better, they're easier to take care of, and they're easier to take care of. It just improves the overall quality of the care that they receive. There was fewer doctor visits, less medication. Again, we talked about the financial components of this. And this one is huge to me, is there was fewer instances of falls. And we know one of the biggest reasons, particularly for women, why they end up leaving their home and having to move into a facility is a broken hip. That is really one of the most common reasons I'm going to watch the stage here so I don't fall off <laughs> as I'm talking about walls. And so for me, I also, as an art therapist, I like to look at the metaphors of what happens with the art. And I think one of the things that was so beautifully spoken of this morning in the um, drum by Mo was the idea of rhythm. And to me, rhythm also requires balance. And so the idea that art has all the components of music, they're just done visually instead of audiologically. And so the idea, like, I love the metaphor that by having the arts in their life, it offered a place for visual balance and visual perception. And when they had that in their lives, it's able to manifest itself not just on an emotional plane, a cognitive plane, but also on a physical plane. But I think regardless of whether you want the metaphor or not, the reduction in falls to me is enough on why we need to have arts programs. Because that really radically shifts people's lives after they fall. And oftentimes that's really also when the depression kicks in pretty profoundly. I think when there's a trauma that happens to an older person, they, you know, they just don't, like they physically don't bounce like they used to. They don't also emotionally bounce like they used to. So it becomes a bigger dynamic for them to transition because it's just time for them to maybe move out of their home or you know, move in where they can get some more care. I'm waiting for someone to cook me dinner every night. I think that sounds good. Whatever the transition is, it's very different to organically make that transition versus to fall, break your hip, and have to transition from the hospital to the rehab hospital to the senior living facility. And that really can make it a very difficult transition for folks. And then better morale that we find not just amongst the patients and their families, but also amongst the staff. And this one is so important, has just come up consistently throughout the day, is loneliness. And I think that's what's so important, is to realize that arts are about community. 
and the capacity to create community. And I think that loneliness and depression go very, very much with adults and with um, gerontality population, that oftentimes when you ask them specific questions about depression, they answer the questions as if it sounds like they actually are clinically depressed. And I don't want to say that that's not true because I think there is epidemic depression among older folks in this country. But if you ask those questions a little bit deeper, you can start to realize that a lot of those folks probably are almost just barely in the depression scale. They only make the clinical um, grade, but really what they are is lonely. And as it was mentioned this morning, particularly for men, they're not going to say, I'm lonely. You know, that's not something that people want to admit. It's something that's almost like a hidden shame amongst gerontology folks, to admit that they're lonely. And having worked with the entire developmental um, scale from preschoolers all the way up, that's true of everybody. People don't like to admit they're lonely. And so if somebody's feeling lonely, that is kind of the precipitous for the depression to kick in. Once the depression biochemically takes hold, it's much more difficult to get them to take their medications regularly, to exercise, to eat healthy, to engage in a social capacity. So it's really, really important that we want to do whatever we can to keep that depression from kicking in. Because it's like a cold. When you got the sniffles, if you tar start taking vitamin C, it's much easier to kind of get back. But once you have a full-on cold, you got to kind of ride it through. And depression can be very much like that as well. Okay. So the other thing that Dr. Cohen proposed is he started looking at the, what he called the psychophysiological ways of looking at the arts. And so he was creating a brand new paradigm of how we look at the arts and look at um, older adults and the impact that it had. Oh, it's over there. So because of his research, there was programs all over um, North America and Canada that created these pretty amazing arts programs. And because of his research, they were able to fund them and hire professional artists. And this was a program that led um, 2006 to 2009 and really looked at specifically at vulnerable and marginalized seniors. So really folks who were either living in facilities or living on their own, but they met the criteria of being marginalized, not just because I think older folks in general can be considered marginalized, but because of who they were. And they led these arts programs. And so they did it in conjunction with British Columbia, and so they turned it into a research project. And what they were looking for was specifically, again, doing it over that three-year period. So there's something about doing it where people are really making a commitment to be able to participate. And the capacity in order for folks to be able to kind of really learn something. So if you think if you want folks to learn something, if I want to learn a new language, I can take it for two weeks, but maybe I can count to five and I know three colors in Spanish. If I really want to start learning the language, I've got to study it for a couple years in order for me to be able to get the depth and the capacity of what I need. And so the other thing that was talked about this morning that they also thought was a really um, important component was the idea of doing exhibits and performances. So it wasn't just about bringing the arts in, which is equally important, but if you kind of put something like a big cherry on the top and are like, we're going to do a performance, you're going to get a higher quality and a higher commitment to having that quality than if you're just kind of engaging in, <coughs> excuse me, like different dramatic dramatic arts. Let me take a sip of water here. And so what they specifically worked on was they did writing, digital photography, digital video, puppetry, dance, and mixed media visual arts. And so the people who were engaged, who signed up for the video class, really truly started to identify as filmmakers. And it's really important if you start thinking that my identity is not just I'm this lonely old person who used to be a retired teacher, who used to be a banker. If you used to be, you're going to start feeling like your value has gone down. But if you are currently doing something, then that will help increase that self-esteem. 
So what they found was one of the most important things, and I think this is really one of the struggles that so many folks address, you know, developmentally when they're dealing with, you know, going through the different life stages, is the notion of providing structure. Because if folks don't have structure to the day, they kind of get lost and they lose their motivation. And if you notice that, for, we notice that with the um, adults as well who are unemployed, that we know if those adults do not stay engaged with some kind of structure, even if they don't go to work every day, but they need to maintain some kind of structure, that that really helps keep them motivated and keeps the depression from becoming a part of their life. So again, it was um, described as a reason to get out of bed. And it was more than just a reason to get out of bed to like fill the day, but it really required that these folks made a commitment and that it had a level of meaning that made it so it was important to these folks. And I think the thing that was particularly interesting is they found that a lot of these folks had chronic health issues. So physically getting from home to the community center where the artists would meet the folks was pretty physically challenging and nobody underestimated the reality that there are physical transportation challenges that occur with this population. But what they found was that the folks were so engaged in what they were doing, that commitment and that meaning and that community that they were finding through the experience was so profound that they found a solution, they found the motivation and they found the coping skills to be able to make decisions and be able to find a way to make it happen for them to engage in the process. Okay. So this comes up all the time, and this is something I see a lot when I work with older folks, is the, the confidence to learn new things. And I see this a lot, is folks will say, oh, I don't know how to do that, and kind of that apathy, oh, I can't do this, oh, I can't try that. And it's almost like they just don't have the confidence to try something new and to learn something. And what they found through the study that they did in Vancouver is that once they started to engage and get a couple sessions of it, mastery that folks realize that they could still learn. They could still stay engaged. They could still learn new things. And I think this will change with um, different populations because I think just the paradigm of aging is changing so profoundly. You know, as was discussed so uh, graciously this morning, is that we used to think like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And we now know that's not true at all. And so, but what they found was that that was really important. Um, and also it was really important to give them meaningful art projects because that got them out of their rut. We all live in patterns of behavior. It's just how humans are. If I asked you how you drive to work, you probably drive to work the exact same way every day. We just have patterns of behavior of how we are. And so then what happens is, is that as we get older, those patterns get older and longer and longer, and we start using them more and more consistently. And I think just that sense of curiosity I think some of it comes from just some of the physical limitations that can kind of happen. I think curiosity can oftentimes require a level of physical engagement or a cognitive engagement. And so I think it's easier for older folks to just kind of give up sometimes because they hit those limitations pretty quickly. And the other thing I think about learning new things is it reduces boredom. And one of the things I think is really important with the folks that we're working with is to realize boredom causes agitation. So a lot of times when the folks we're working are agitated, I would stop and ask myself or ask my team, are these folks being sensory stimulated enough? Or are they kind of bored and they're just kind of feeling agitated and then agitation kind of manifests itself physically? Does that make sense? Okay. And this was the other thing that I think is really important, is that when they got together as a group to work on a group project, they provided each other feedback. And I think one of the things that I see and I used to do when I would do projects with um, older folks myself is I would be so focused on some of the physical, like the, you know, because of the arthritis and some of the um, occupational therapy needs and some of the cognitive needs, I would get so focused on the individual being able to be successful in their project that I kind of lost the group concept. 
And that is so important, that we really got to keep focusing on being interactive, not just as community as we're all like working together separately. So it's not like that parallel play, but the idea that we are all truly engaging and participating, offering each other feedback, offering each other support, that that doesn't go away when folks get older, but I find that it's a very common thing to happen when folks are doing art projects or art activities with um, seniors is to kind of keep it focused more on the individual doing their project. So any capacity that you have where you can bring them in to participate with each other, create a cohort where they're supporting each other, your attendance will go up significantly. <coughs> The other thing that is really important is the idea of seeking meaning. And we all know that. Like when you get to the end of your life, there's two things you look at. You look at was I loved deeply? And did I love deeply? And did it matter that I was here? And how it matters that I was here is because of the events in your life that gave you meaning. And everyone has their own definition of what gives them meaning. So for some people, that will be their family and their kids. For other people, it will be the job that they held and the work they did in their job. Some people find meaning through nature and through experiences, climbing mountains, whatever it is. That's really an important part. And what we know is that the arts always create meaning for people. They always connect people to a deeper level of themselves and to their lives. Coping with emotional stress. This is just not just for gerontology. This is true for everybody. Everybody has emotional stress. And I think that's just a really important thing to realize is that we are now, as I said, we're now looking at the body and the mind-body connection in a totally different way. And we're realizing that when somebody has emotional stress, it's starting to cause disease in their body. Most of the inflammation diseases are caused by environmental toxins, poor diet, and stress. So we know that, and Alzheimer's is starting to be linked as being an inflammation-related disease. And so what we found was that when the uh, artists, and I call them artists when I work with them, and some residents don't like that. It feels like too big of a title for them. And so what I will do is I'll encourage them to just try that title on for the next hour just like you would try on a hat or try on a new pair of shoes, just to try something else on. So for me, it helps them think of themselves as getting outside of their daily habits and trying to learn something new. And when I try, find that I try to encourage them to learn something new, we kind of get a little bit into a power struggle. So I just started calling them artists, and then they can try that on or not try it on. It's up to them. So what we found is that making art reduces stress. It helps emotional release. It helps calm you down physically, emotionally, spiritually. And then the other thing that happens a lot is that folks have the opportunity to tell their story. And so oftentimes, when they're making art, it really links to memory. And they always start telling stories about different times of your life. So like last week, I was doing a weaving project with a group of folks. And the weaving project is just like scraps of you know, fabric. But all these folks were telling us about all these different things they used to sew in their lives, and sewing their daughter's prom dress. And so it really linked to memory. And being able to tell their story, and being able to link back to who they were, another dynamic that happens for folks when they get to the um, older uh, phases of their life, they want to make sure that people still know they're there and they want to be remembered. They want to know that their life mattered. Okay? So I'm going to get into the emotional uh, support a little bit more and a little bit more biological detail. So what happens is when you make art, it balances your autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic and parasympathetic branch. And what we now know is that the um, parasympathetic and um, sympathetic nervous system is linked to your immune system's ability to fight infection. And also it's like what helps you be able to like go through your day where you have highs, you have lows, because that's part of being human. But the highs don't don't get too high and the lows don't get too low. So the sympathetic branch of the nervous system is the get up and go. 
Um, it's also on the extreme, it's the flee or fight. The parasympathetic branch is the rest and digest. It's also the renew and the heal. And so that's really a big piece. And so what we're looking for is that um, you want to have a healthy nervous system because how you cope in this world is directly connected to your nervous system. So that we know that people whose nervous systems are overstimulated, in layman's terms, you would probably call them kind of high strung, have a tendency to kind of overreact to situations when they get overwhelmed. So what we're learning is that if we have a calmer nervous system, if we calm the nervous system, it helps people go through what's considered a normal arousal, activation, and settle category. So again, people are able to cope and have mastery over their environment as well as over their emotions. And so what happens is when folks um, get overstimulated, the, sim the systems get stuck. So what happens is, is you have, um, it either gets stuck on, and that's where you see the hypervigilance, the panic, the anxiety, or it gets stuck off. And that's where you see the depression and the lethargy. But what we also are starting to see is what's happening when people's systems are overstimulated is it's like the brake and the gas are going on simultaneously, and they just flood. So if you flood a car, what happens to the car? It doesn't go anywhere, it just stops and stands still. So what we're finding is that you really want to have a um, calmed and balanced autonomic nervous system. And we know that the arts can provide that. It can calm the nervous system so that people can be able to like, you know, take kind of the bumps as they come, take the stimulation as it comes. Because I think that's the other thing that happens is that um, just being able to deal with daily events just becomes taking more and more physical energy, and folks are finding if they don't have that physical energy, it causes an emotional reaction. So the other thing that was really important for them with their experience with the art was their feelings of being competent as artists. If people feel competent, they feel valued. If they feel valued, they feel like their life matters. And everybody's life matters. I know that, you know that, that's why we do the work that we do. But if a person doesn't feel of value, it's gonna be a very different way of how they respond and interact with the world around them. And that was the other thing, is that the people who engaged in this art activity actually said it changed the way they perceived their world. So when you start taking an art class, or you start looking at color, you start looking at texture, it starts getting you connected to the details of your life. And that's one of the things I tend to find when I work with older folks, is they stop kind of not just paying attention to the details because of maybe they can't hear things like they used to or see things like they used to, but there's almost a numbing that can sometimes occur. A kind of just like, well, life is what it is. I'm just going to kind of, you know, at this point, I'm going to get on the boat and just let it take me through to the end of the train, instead of being fully actively engaged in the world. So when you start getting people engaged in the world and talking about color and talking about texture and having them connect the art class into their life, it helps them stay more engaged and motivated to stay connected to their world. Okay, let me check time here, because I... Okay. So, I always think it's important to look at the strengths and looking at people from a strengths perspective. And um, so for a lot of these folks, is what's come up t um, today throughout this is that we find there's many folks who have made art throughout their life, they just haven't made it in a long time. And there's other folks who just for whatever reason did other things, they might have done sports, um, they might have done cooking, there might have been different ways in which they engaged in their uh, creative process. 
And so one of the things that this group found that was really important was that when the quality of the artwork that was provided was at a professional level, it made them take their creativity to a different level. It really made them think about it. And that really made a difference because if they really had to commit, they really had to think, they really had to engage, they really had to try, it increased their level of mastery and increasing the level of mastery increased their self-esteem. Um, and then the other thing that was really important for the folks that it did is it engaged them from week to week. So it gave them something to think about and something to do in between sessions. So it really helped connect them that it's not just like I went, I did my project, and now I go home and I go back to the same place where I was before. I have a sense of future, I have a sense of hope, I have a sense of connection, I have a sense of movement, which is a really important component that happens in people's lives. And then the other thing that was really important for them by doing a multi-step process and engaging in a longer-term project is they really found value in being able to see something from the beginning to the end because they found that so many of the projects that they were doing, and some of this has to do with time and there's other dynamics that go into this, but if you don't really spend time working on something and really taking it through the different steps, you don't get the same sense of accomplishment as if you've really worked on something over time. Uh, what else have we not talked about? So these are all things we've kind of covered in other capacities. Okay, so they too did a study. As I said, they were doing a study through the University of Brit British Columbia. And these are the findings that they found. Um, again, there was a perceived health status. So people felt like they were feeling better. So they believed that they were feeling better and they were acting like they were feeling better, so they were engaging in the lifestyles and the interventions necessary for them to actually feel better. Because a lot of times we have, to, we have that expression, you gotta fake it till you make it. You know, so if you start believing that you can start to feel better, that's what's gonna give you the motivation to still do the walks, to still take your medications, whatever your exercise is. Chronic pain went down. And that is really huge, because if any of you have ever had any kind of chronic pain, it's hard to feel good when, you don't, when you're in physical pain. Pain really starts to overstimulate the nervous system. So what they were showing through the chronic pain was by you know, reducing the, and having that normal autonomic nervous system, that normal up and down, it really helped reduce the pain. So it helped the physical pain and it also is gonna help reduce the emotional pain. And again, it increased a sense of community. And I think we just are gonna keep hearing that over and over again, that the arts are about community, they're about connections, they're about being with other people. And I think that's just incredibly important for folks. Okay, so what I would like to do is if we could turn up the lights, if that would be possible. I don't, I'm not the keeper of the lights, so. And I know this is not exactly the most, um, connected way to engage with each other, but I think this is a really important opportunity for us as a community to come together. You're all here because you're interested in the arts. Um, and I'd like to have a, a brief dialogue, a brief discussion. I like folks to be able to answer questions, talk about the arts programs that are going on in their facilities so that people can engage with others. And just what are your thoughts about how we can be bringing the arts more into our communities, into our facilities, into our settings, Things, and to share information and to ask some questions. So I believe there are still mics up there. So does somebody have a question or something that they would like to share how they're bringing the arts into their community? I think we should do the mic so everybody can hear. Um, so if y'all want to, can somebody get up and be my bringer of the mic? And I can stand up here and facilitate. Hello, can you hear me? Uh-huh. All right. I have... Um, so why don't you tell us your name sure. and where you're coming from so people can make some connections because right. I think that's an important part of these workshops. Uh, my name's Rachel Campbell and um, I actually have a Master's of Art Education from Kutztown University 
And after three years of teaching in public school, long-term sub, substitute, contracted position got cut, blah, blah, blah. I was redirected to assisted living. My facility is called the Bridges at Bent Creek in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And it's now called a personal care facility. Um, so the, <clears throat> the reason why I took it is because it had benefits and Don't <laughs> I could stay somewhere benefits. and um, that I could do art with them. But I thought at first I would do part time and still sub, whatever. After three years, I've been there. And um, after the first year, we did an art show. And um, it really, it was exciting for them to see their own artwork on display on the art grids that I did, you know, in the high schools and the elementary schools every year. And they helped, you know, mount their artwork during art class. We talked it up for weeks and weeks and weeks. And some of them didn't really remember, you know, because I work with an Alzheimer's group. Um, but some of them, they never saw their artwork on display ever. And I just remember the one lady that was so quiet, never speaks, like, she was still pretty good at painting, but she just didn't talk much. And she just, like, walked around the whole time, like, taking it all in, like. And um, some of the other residents that are in a higher art class that, you know, some of them are better painters than me. So they had their artwork up too. And then we did a whole fundraiser that all of the funds raised from that art show went to Alzheimer's Association. And I think we raised like $1,000. So actually last spring was our first one and this will be our second one. So I'm coming up on my third year. I'm not there three years yet. Um, but that's one thing that then, you know, the marketers, when they say, oh, come to the bridges, look, we just had this art show, and then it, we have a bulletin uh, or pamphlet that says, like, highlight, spotlight artists, and just says, like, what got them into art, what they like about making art, and it really is like, oh, wow, I'm a spotlight artist. Um, so that's a big thing that we do. All and, right. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. And that's okay. And... Um, what um, I was also hired to start was um, integrating art with young children. So we invite um, whoever, basically, but we especially have a relationship with the Catholic Church that's close by, and their laypersons come in to give communion. So we invite their kids, we invite the grandkids of the residents, was like the most positive benefit instead of coming in and being like what do I touch in your room or not touch you know or like where do we go in this <clears throat> scary place um, we can instead just go to this activity room and I love little kids I've worked with them tons of times and I love my residents and basically they're kind of at the same playing field in some ways right. of what they're able to make Sure. And the one resident, like, she can't even really make stuff anymore, but she just loves spending time with her granddaughter and seeing her make art. And so it's a positive place, you know, to share yeah. art. And so we call it uh, something about, you know, art through the ages. Great. And building a bridge through art, that's what we call it. <coughs> We're at the bridges at Bend Creek. <laughs> Thank so you. Thanks for letting me share. So what I want to point out is she brings up two, what was your name again? I'm sorry. Rachel. Rachel brings up two very good points that the arts can do. Number one, they are great fundraisers. It's really a great way if you're looking for different ways to market your facility, to let people know about the events that are going on in your facilities, is to be able to use either an art exhibit or to spotlight the artists. And the other thing that she brought up, which is a really great point, is to make it a family-friendly facility so that people want to come. Because if it comes to the point that it's hard to bring your grandkids, the grandkids don't have a positive experience, they don't know what to do, they're not clear on what the rules are, what the regulations are, you're gonna reduce the amount of visits that are gonna happen. 
And we really know that when the families come, that really makes a huge difference on health, on morale, on everything. So there's lots of ways that you can use the arts to create family-friendly programming that is not just about the residents, it's also about their families and connecting to the different programs. Are there other questions? Does someone have another question? Can you, can my, somebody bring it down for me? Thank you. I, I just have a simple question. Um, I, do, I volunteer for several art programs in the Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I would like to introduce is weaving. Could you explain how you do weaving? Sure, so we, I've just started doing weaving. I am not a weaver at all. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. So what we did is I'm working with Jill Odegaard. She's a uh, department head of the art department at Cedar Crest College, and she's engaged in a project called the Woven Weaving Project, which they're looking for facilities. So if you're interested, you can contact me. My contact information's up here. And what we do is we build a loom that's probably, you know, like those large sheets of paper, about 18 by 24. So it's a little bit bigger than that. It's literally like two strips drilled together with two nails all, all all across the side and then we just take strips of fabric and if you're looking for fabric ask anyone who sews if they'll donate fabric to you and you will get a large pad of fabric you cut them in strips that are you know the length of the loom and then you tie them together and what we're doing is we're doing the um, we're doing the tie you know we tie on the warp so we tie it something to weave on and you literally just weave the fabric strips you know into like rugs so like everybody will have like a rug piece. And how we do it, which is a little bit different with Jill's project, is that she does it where you do it with four people. So you have t one person on one side, one person on this side, one person on this side, one person on this side, and you weave halfway and then you hand the um, fabric over to the next person, then you weave halfway and then you kind of go around. And so basically you make some of those like bathroom or you know, you can see them at like, uh, um, like farmer's market, like that kind of texture rug. And so what her goal is, is they're going to different facilities. We went to Luther Crest last week. We're going to different facilities and everyone's gonna be weaving a rug and then that rug is gonna be put together in the Allentown Art Museum and they're gonna be having an exhibit in the fall. What I found though is it was a really easy way to get people to engage and the thing about fabric that is so wonderful is everybody connects to fabric. Everybody has memories of fabric. Not everybody has memories of sculpture or plaster or paint. Most people do, but it's not the same thing. People connect to things that are home. Fabric and food are two places where people connect to home. So if you want to talk to people about home, you can talk about what they used to have for dinner. You know, and they'll really start telling you the family recipes. Does that answer your question? Great answer, thank you. Okay, yeah. But weaving is a pretty simple thing to do. And any way that you can get folks to weave, and that's what I love about Jill's project, is that it's not just everybody weaving their own little project. It's everybody coming together, and because it's on a table, um, people in wheelchairs can wheel up, take their turn, and the next folks can go. And you know who are the sewers, because if you don't put the colors in the right combination, they're like, that's not gonna work. It's pretty funny because I'm not a sewer and I get in trouble all the time. Other, can you use the mic so everyone can hear? Oh, oh, yay! I got a little mic person. Thank you. I just wanted to say I've done weaving on the meat packages, the foam meat packages. If you go to your local butcher and explain where you work and what you're using it for, and you can notch, if you get the long ones, you can notch into either end and string the yarn back and forth, and it makes a great free loom for a you know, a one chance project, so. Absolutely, one of the things I always want to think about when I'm working with folks is um, if the, the, is really being conscious of fine motor skills, and all of that. So I usually try to tape the paper down. 
So if I'm doing weaving, I'll tape the loom down on the table, I'll tape the paper down. So when somebody's hand is moving across it, it doesn't move the tape, the paper too. So I find, if, especially with weaving, if you can just tape it down, it will hold it in space, and that will help reduce um, frustration. Yeah, question. Right here, thank you, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there's still this considerable struggle to implement art therapy and expressive arts programming, um, despite the fact that there is empirical evidence and how it's still kind of viewed as this novelty. Um, do you have any other recommendations for you know, these very large seminal studies that can make it a more persuasive pitch uh, to yeah. administrators? I'm so glad you asked. So we now have empirical evidence, and I have the information that you are welcome to use. And this is the deal, I also think. We have to stop changing our perceptions and start thinking about the arts as a medical intervention. This is a medical intervention. This isn't hobby time. This isn't fill-in time. We now have research that if you can do something to reduce falls, that's a medical intervention. And this is, I really love what Mo said, that you can start on um, you know, doing things for free, and I'm not discouraging that at all, but I also am gonna say that we need to start pr prioritizing the arts programs as a medical intervention, and I truly believe if it's a priority, it will be funded. So I think that's an important you know, thing to kind of discuss. But I think the key piece is the more you start speaking of the program from a medical perspective, and for those of you who are staying for the Alzheimer's, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the brain, but I think the more you bring in the research, the empirical evidence, the role that the brain plays in um, the arts and with the folks that we're working with and not treat it as like it is physical therapy, Therapy, I'm just gonna say art therapy, occupational therapy, it's not a linear order, they're all equally relevant. And so I think we as advocates, the more that we start looking at it and discussing it from a medical intervention perspective, it will increase the capacity for people to see it not as a make and take art projects. And that's also another reason to not just do 20 minute projects, but to really bring in professional level artists or professional level art therapists to help with that intervention. I think it's also the paradigm is starting to shift and I think if you don't have the arts in your facility, you're gonna start becoming behind the times which I think is great, but I do think there still needs to be more of that. But I do agree that I don't know that I would fund a program without empirical evidence, but Dr. Cohn's research has really opened that door. I think we have time for one more. So another question? I appreciate you. Oh. I have found that music throughout a building is very important. It has a calming effect on almost everyone mm -hmm. that walks through or is sitting there. Mm -hmm. They, particularly the music that's easy listening on TV, they have various well, there's about five or six music channels that we have. And it does have a very calming effect mm -hmm. because I've turned it on in the lobbies and so forth just to see how much of a calming effect it has. Mm -hmm. And it smooths the day out for the people. Absolutely, and it speaks to that nervous system. So I'm speaking about the visual components of the arts and how the nervous system is calm through the visual arts. But you can do that through music, you can do that through movement, you can do that through poetry, through writing. It's all a different modality to calm the nervous system. And it's proven that if that autonomic nervous system is balanced and calm and you got the perfect balance of a little bit of arousal because you do want to get up and go talk to folks and have lunch, and then you also need to have that rest and digest. 
digest. That when you have these elements as every day, not as extras, but it's like you have medication, you have bath time, you have art time, it is part of the care we provide these folks. That's really when we're treating whole person health care. That's really holistic health care. All right, well, thank you all very much. I hope this was helpful. Feel free to be in touch if you have additional questions. And um, there's lots of great choices, and I appreciate you coming to see my speak.